So before I'd like to jump right into um, the Happiness Lab podcast, um, Father Shanley, I'd like to address the reality that we're all living in and through. And I wonder if you could just share with the group how you're doing and perhaps offer a few words about the state of the college and the health and safety of our PC community. Sure. Um, I'm healthy, thank God. Uh, no one in our community is sick from the virus. Uh, we're kind of uh, doing interesting social distancing. Um, we still have masks in the morning and we stay six feet apart from each other. So we at least have some comfort of worship, which I feel bad for folks that don't have that right now. The campus is uh, eerily quiet. It's I feel like I'm walking through a ghost town. And as the weather is nice and the the flowers are blooming. This is really the prettiest time of the year on campus, and it just seems strange uh, to not have students around. As um, someone who's an introvert by nature, I love having this much downtime because uh, I'm able to read more. I'm listening to more podcasts. Uh, it's driving me crazy that I can't watch any sports, uh, but other than that, I'm doing pretty well. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to thank you for sharing that because I think a lot of people are um, in touch with, with many of us here at the college and really wanna know how we're doing. And I know for, for many of the community, um, they're sharing their, their thoughts and certainly their prayers with us. Um, but before any of us coronavirus, you would be listening to this Happiness Lab podcast. Um, and I think they're on last count, there's something like a million active podcasts out there, lots of content to be for us all to be consuming, and, and there's a lot of good stuff out there. So what drew you to this one in the first place, and what kept you listening? I don't remember where I learned about it, but it just sounded intriguing to me, and it's connected up with my own teaching, because the topic of happiness is the central topic of the ethics class that I teach. And this year I actually incorporated a book by a psychologist called The Happiness Hypothesis, where this psychologist, John Jonathan Haidt, examined ancient ideas about happiness from a modern psychological perspective. And uh, so I'd been thinking about the different ways in which um, moral philosophers think about happiness and what moral philosophy can learn from psychology. So that made the happiness lab uh, intriguing to me. And from the first five minutes, I was just totally hooked and fascinated um, to think about happiness from a psychological point of view. And I found Lori Santos to be such a gifted teacher that she drew me right in. I still remember the first podcast I listened to. I, it was like an NPR moment. I didn't want to get out of the car because I hadn't finished it, but I had to have dinner with somebody. Uh, I drove to Westerly and listened to the first episode uh, of the show. And I've been hooked ever since. I look forward to it um, every week. And the second season has just started. I haven't listened to today's episode yet, but um, I will do that this afternoon. Terrific. And it's interesting that you mentioned that you bring this into your, your teaching because I think for one of the things that certainly struck me, I have uh, college age children and certainly working um, on a college campus, um, Lori Santos mentions that one of the reasons that she started the Happiness Lab um, or started the course that ultimately led to the Happiness Lab podcast um, was because she had noticed trends and unhappiness among the college age uh, student population and that there was this growing dissatisfaction uh, among that group. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you may have seen that trend um, come together over the past as you've been president of Providence College. And if you um, think that what Lori Santos is teaching in these podcasts can be effective for, for the, the college student population. Yeah, I mean, she begins um, her podcast talking about how, you know, she's a, she did work in canine uh, stuff. She, she had never taught this class and she became the, um, the, the, they used to call it master, not anymore, at Yale of Silliman College. And it brought her close to the daily lives of students. And she was stunned by how much psychic distress 
that she found among the kids that she was interacting with, and particularly high amounts of anxiety and depression. And you'd, you'd think it'd sort of be counterintuitive, like you're Yale, you're you know, the kings and queens of the universe, and actually those kids are incredibly stressed out. And you know, that resonated with me because we know that this is true of the college age population in general and of Providence College also. So we see very high rates of anxiety and depression uh, among our students. And I think some of what she teaches in that course can be really helpful for our students. And I'll just give you one example that we've picked up on. Uh, one of the episodes is about how mindfulness has demonstrated psychological value for everyone and for college students in particular. And uh, one of the episodes has her live trying to, you know, have her students go through a mindfulness episode. And, you know, we've contracted with a woman at Brown um, who specializes in mindfulness, athletics is using it, um, student life is using it. It's just one example of a relatively simple practice um, which can help our students in terms of their levels of anxiety. And I think that's especially true in a time of pandemic where everyone's anxiety is just spiking through the roof. And that's why, you know, she had some special uh, COVID uh, virus episodes. Um, and that, that piece was, was a mind, one of them was a mindfulness piece. Um, so there's a lot of practical advice. And as she likes to say, you know, evidence-based psychology, this is not, because it sounds like as soon as you start talking about mindfulness, it makes you think of, you know, hippies walking around singing um or something like that. But yeah. there's, there's real, there really is science that mindfulness can help you. And it's kind of reassuring um, when she um, brings people on the show and you learn things that you didn't know before about um, the simplest things. Like I remember listening to the first episode and one of the things she talks about is gratitude. And she talks about it a lot. And that the practice of gratitude in our lives is really um, important for our well being. And that's something that I was practicing anyway through prayer. Um, it's the fundamental form of prayer is to say thanks and to count your blessings. And so little things like that, even, you know. The latest episode or last week's episode, again, was talking about what psychologists would call pro-social behavior, um, basically doing nice things for other people. Not only does that make them happy, but it also makes the doer happy. Mm -hmm. um, she has a podcast on sleep. Our kids are sleep deprived. And one of the simplest things they can do is get better and more sleep. Um, so the, the things that she talks about are relatively simple, in some ways obvious concepts. But as she says, uh, the hardest thing is not the information that she's imparting, but it's the formation of new habits, uh, new habits of mind. And that's the real hard part about being happy is she calls it rewiring yourself so that you learn to practice healthy habits rather than some of the destructive habits that we practice. Like for example, you know, in this time period, um, psychologists like she would tell you, don't keep looking at the news um, because the news is just gets depressing. And if you check your, uh, your news t 20 times a day, it's still a pandemic and nothing has changed and you're more anxious. And I find myself often going back to my news sources, which is usually online. I'm like, I just did this an hour ago. Why am I doing this again? It's still gonna be crappy out there and it's just gonna make me feel worse. So there are a lot of little things you can do um, to reduce anxiety and become uh, happier in your life. And that's why uh, I find it so tantalizing. It's like, why did I need a psychologist to tell me this stuff? It, some of it's pretty obvious, but um, it's reassuring when it comes from her. It absolutely is, and it's funny that you, you're mentioning, too, things that seem obvious when she says them, but it's, it, some of it does fly in the face of what we, are, we hear or we, we think we know, right? So you mentioned sleep. Uh, there is this fallacy or this kind of um, idea that, well, if, you get, if, you are do, if you're, you're, you're on, 
more and you don't need a lot of sleep, you'll be successful because you have more time to get to the things you want to do. But as she describes, that is in fact not the case. And, and I was struck by, she had said, if you don't get at least five hours of sleep, or uh, if you get less than five hours of street sleep, and you go out and drive, it's, it's, it's the equivalent to driving drunk. So um, things like that, I think those, those are really important for people to hear. You had mentioned gratitude and aligned it with, uh, with prayer, and, and that, that is something that is and has been an integral part of, of your life and something you've been practicing. Um, when I, I thought that it was very interesting when we think about the, the connection between happiness and faith. Um, there are lots of studies out there that show that there is a connection between having a faith or having spirituality in your life and how you would rate yourself as happy. Um, and in some of these studies, the only um, differentiator between somebody who is not happy and happy is, is this, um, this spirituality that they have in their life, their faith. Um, so I, I wonder if you could share, does this podcast and its research-based approach, the evidence-based approach that, that you mentioned earlier, um, to achieving, reinforce that connection between faith and joy for you? Yeah, it, you know, it's interesting. Um, she never talks much about religion in the podcast. And I know that's because she's a psychologist and she wants to stay in the domain that she stays in. And I've, I've thought a lot about the difference between mindfulness and prayer. Um, mindfulness as it's normally defined is basically you start off with breathing exercises and uh, then you graduate. She um, has taken people through some gratitude mindfulness mm -hmm. um, and like some sort of thinking positive thoughts about other people. Um, and I think prayer is something different than all that, although, you know, for some people, some form of mindfulness is the beginning of prayer, like to try to shut out of your mind the things that are weighing on you and distracting you so, to, so as to open yourself up to God. Uh, but prayer is a, is a kind of ecstasy where you, in a sense, you get out of your mind and you try to connect with God. So I, I see prayer as a little bit different or actually a lot different from mindfulness but uh, I think both can be helpful but I know you know if you're a religious person I know that correlation um, correlation doesn't always mean causation but in this case mm -hmm. I, I think it actually does I think I'm happier because I do think God is active in my life and um, and and I have less stress than people who don't operate in that premise as much as I'm stressed out like everyone is about what to do um, in this time, uh, I alter I, every day. I'm coming back to God and saying, okay, it's in your hands. Um, I'm only the president of Providence College, you're God. Um, and I need to trust that we're going to get through this. And I need to trust that you're going to help me and uh, my colleagues figure out what the right thing to do is. So that uh, I think when you're a believer and you go through difficult times, um, you approach it differently. Um, it's not Pollyanna-ish either. I know what the problems are, but uh, you kind of trust in a higher power. And, you know, one thing that has struck me uh, about uh, a lot of what she says, and, and even one of her episodes, she had a philosophy professor on talking about stoicism. Um, and back in my civ days, I used to teach, you know, uh, do a lecture on stoicism, and the, the simple point that, um, that she makes often, and this relates to the mindfulness, but I think it also, in a sense, relates to prayer, is that the only thing we can control is our attitude uh, toward things. We can't control the world around us. Uh, and this was the Stoic credo, is to, to, in a sense, not get ruffled by the stuff that goes around because the only thing you can control is your inner attitude. And if you're a person of faith, it's that inner attitude um, that helps you to maintain a certain kind of peace in the midst of difficulties. Um, you know, there's a, I've been reading another book uh, by another psychologist, maybe we could talk about her at the end, um, but she talks about human freedom. And this is again, as a stoic idea, 
being between the stimulus and the response. Um, the stimulus is what we feel and then we respond. And it's that space in between that we can control things and not necessarily always respond to the stimulus in the most immediate way. And that ability to, to get a little bit away from stimulus response is, um, is a piece of mindfulness and I also think it's part of prayer. I, I think that's relevant when, uh, when Lori talks about screen time and a, a term that I hadn't heard before, which I think is brilliant, is the screen life balance. Um, and in particular related to the pandemic and how people are feeling about screen time. So that idea of agency that you are, the stimulus may be what you're seeing on a screen or checking Twitter for the, the third time in an hour, um, and how you might respond to that, that time in between, and, and actually, uh, you know, I, I see the mindfulness there is understanding your attitude toward it, or, or toward it, or how it's making you feel, can help you to make that decision, and that, I think what you're saying is that control over what the response is, is that in between, you don't have to let, you don't have to respond in the way your mind automatically goes to if you can put yourself in the middle of the stimulus and the response. So definitely with screen time, I'm seeing that. Um, and, and I think you've already referred to this. This is that that can be really dangerous for people's mental health right now. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of stuff written in it. There's an article in New York Times op-ed page today about um, why Zoom is so unsatisfying. No offense to anybody here. Um, it is. And it it's but it's all we have right now, especially with people that are distant from us. And I think the, the podcast that she wrote about managing screens was a really good one for this time because screens are both the bane um, and a blessing. Um, they, they can't substitute for human interactions, uh, but it's all we got. And, and so, you know, she talks about Zooming with her college roommates that she hasn't done anything with for a while. Um, we've had some cocktail hour Zooms for the cabinet, uh, which we would normally do in person. And once you do it a few times, it's not as weird as it is the first time that you do it. Um, so this it, I, is interesting. Um, one of the things I read recently talked about how it's better to talk on the phone than Zoom, because you're at least, when you're talking on the phone, there's there's a feeling of intimacy that you have because it's like ear to ear. You're you're taught and you're used to it, and you don't have any high expectations. Uh, and one of the things I've tried to do during this pandemic is consciously every day I pick up the phone to call somebody in my life just to check in, like, "Hey, how you doing?" Uh, like I talked to my sister last night. I hadn't talked to her for a few weeks, and you know we had a great chat on the phone. And I called Coach Cooley last night and had a nice long chat with him. It had been a while since I've seen him. So I'm, I think it's really important to be consciously intentional in this time of reaching out to people because I'm, what I'm realizing is that um, I'm less socially isolated than a lot of people that I know who are really hunkered down in various situations and maybe only talk to their families. Um, and, uh, I, maybe I should practice social distancing more, but I actually see enough people during the day that I, uh, while I miss people, I don't feel deprived, but I know that there are some people, especially like my sister's husband is, is compromised, so he can't go out. They don't do much of anything. And, you know, she would love to just drive to Narragansett. Uh, they have a house there and go check on the garden, but she can't. Um, and you start to realize, um, and this is something, I want to recommend John Krasinskis' videos. Uh, I watched the latest one today, you know, some good news. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I think he said this, or somebody said this, when I, when I look at my life, I go, I'm so lucky. Um, I'm healthy. I, I got enough to eat. Um, you know, there are the things, and this is, goes back to gratitude, you know, in a time like this, we really do have to consciously practice gratitude uh, for what we have. And it has to be on a daily basis. Um, I tell this story that, you know, I have a, a Jesuit spiritual director who's this really smart 
uh, 80-something-year-old Jesuit who's seen it all in the spiritual life. And one of the things he said to me um, is that the Jesuits have this practice called the examen, where every day at the end of the day, you're supposed to review your day and look at uh, opportunities taken, opportunities lost, things that you could have done or you should have done, mistakes you've made. Uh, he said, I don't like to think about the bad stuff. He goes, uh, what I do is I think about the things I'm grateful for during the day. And I acknowledge those as gifts from God, that that was where God was in my life. And I think if every day you can count those things, uh, and it can be even simple, simple things um, that you're happy for from the day, you can point and say, that's where God was in my life. And I, I think she addresses that in the podcast. And I, it's, um, I, I, psychology of counting your blessings, she calls it. So it's, it's having this practice, um, whichever way it works for you to experience gratitude. I, another thing that I think is interesting about gratitude that she addresses, and I, I wonder, um, you know, seeing being in higher ed and thinking about return on investment of education and thinking about our focus on uh, liberal arts at Providence College, um, that there is this idea that there are two types of virtues, the resume virtues and the eulogy virtues. I, I thought this was a fascinating um, topic that she addressed during the podcast. That, and the idea there is that your eulogy virtues are about character and the things you'd want somebody to say about you maybe at, at your funeral. And your resume virtues are the things that are gonna help you get a job and really show ambition and success. Um, but what she found in the science behind this is that by building character and by uh, building those virtues that, that you might think are eulogy virtues, uh, the people who do those things are the ones who find themselves more successful. So I think of John Krasinski all the time in some good news. There is no doubt that his just gratitude for the world and going in this direction may ultimately result in in success for his career that has nothing directly to do with this. It's just that he's out there being a really good citizen right now. Yes, he is. And, and you know, that distinction between resume virtues and eulogy virtues, I think comes from David Brooks. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, and uh, she picked up on that. He has that book, which I have not read, his most recent book, where he talks about uh, virtues. And, you know, I kind of smile when I hear this because this is Aristotle. Okay. Uh, you know, the most, the, the whole, I've taught the Nicomachean Ethics 50 times. And uh, Aristotle says the most important question in your life is what is going to make you flourish? And flourishing involves activities, it's what we do. And because what we do shapes who we are. And so when she talks about habits and how, you know, bad habits are hard to break. Good habits take work to form them. Aristotle says the same thing. You've, you need, Aristotle says you need tutors. You need people that are going to help you and guide you to do the right things until the right thing becomes obvious to you and you're able to do it on your own. So, um, and the idea that there are certain virtues that are maybe functional uh, virtues that make you a good accountant, that make you maybe a good college president. But then Aristotle says, well, what makes you a good human being? And um, you know, things like courage, um, which you know, is one of the most important virtues in life. And it's, it's one that we're all being tested with right now. It's how do we deal with fear? Um, and how do you develop uh, courage in your life? How do you develop gratitude? That's a virtue. It's a practice. Um, how do you develop care for others, which is a eulogy virtue? Um, friendship, Aristotle spends two books talking about friendship. He says, who could imagine a good life without friends? Um, so I do come back to Height's book. I think, you know, we're in some ways, we're coming back and discovering some deep truths that people have known about a long time and now they're sexy because they're in psychological dress. So I'm, I'm all for it. <laughs>
<laughs> just dress it up in a podcast and everything yep. old is new again. Um, I, I will say the, when talking about this time and, and you've mentioned a few tactics that are working for you, reaching out to people. And um, I, I will say that I think that I experienced the first sense of dread about this. And I, I happened to be in a Chino hall sitting at my computer when I got the alert that the, the Big East tournament was canceled. And this was, what, an hour, two hours before Coach Cooley was going to head out on, on the court with the team at Madison Square Garden. And it just, that, that, that feeling of, of dread and anxiety and uncertainty was very powerful. And um, I, again, I, I, I hope others who have not had an opportunity to listen to the Happiness Lab will, because it, it definitely has helped me during this time for sure. But um, you know, everything that happened after that, you know, they made the call at, at Madison Square Garden. And then we ended up, uh, most of the staff ended up transitioning to working remotely. Students and faculty pivoted to distance and learning and teaching. Um, so, and, and we're still in a place where we're struggling with uncertainty, right? So we're not, we're planning. Um, we're all trying to do our best to ha have an understanding of what lies ahead. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, what you've seen that's been working for you about pl applying the science of happiness to help with with that uncertainty that lies ahead and and how, you know, you might have heard tactics that other people are using and, and heard from either from the podcast or just things that you've heard from others um, that that you're modeling during this time of uncertainty. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about a lot of them already. The, the gratitude piece, I think, is a simple piece to do. And she talks about the science that even the act of writing down things, like if you, one of the, the exercises she mentioned is if you every day take time to reflect and write down three things that you're grateful for, that there's a demonstrated uh, positive effect on your affect if, if you're able to do that. You know, the pro-social behavior piece, trying to think, uh, how can I help somebody? Um, you know, maybe it is just a phone call. There's the social connection piece um, can be a pro-social activity or, you know, trying to think about, um, and, there's, and she talks about this in the podcast, uh, one of the podcasts was about a couple of college kids who started um, this service when the pandemic broke out where they uh, recruited other college kids who were healthy to shop for elderly neighbors or people that couldn't go out. And so, you know, finding ways in the middle of pandemic um, to do things uh, for other people can, can make you feel better. Figuring out how to, to feel like you still have some agency in your life. Um, you know, how can you choose things? I think, you know, figuring out how to be mindful when you're stuck with your spouse and your kids in the same space. I'm lucky. I just, Father Scott and I occupy two ends of the house and I can be as alone as I want to be. But, you know, it may be a conscious choice. I mean, I, it's been funny reading about um, even like psych, psychotherapists doing therapy from their bathrooms. Because for a lot of people, even on the Krasinskis thing this morning, one of the high school kids he was interviewing, I'm like, she's in her bathroom. and Because that's maybe the only place in her house where she can have some peace and some privacy. So she's sitting on the top of the toilet. Um, you know, trying to find a place for uh, mindfulness in your house, how to stay connected. You know, people are sleep deprived. I mean, a lot of people are anxious. So making sure, you know, that you're getting enough sleep. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of things that you can do to be healthy, um, but you kind of have to choose it. And that's one of the big themes is, you, you know, it's, it is about choice and it is about intention. And as she says multiple times, being happy is work. You got to do stuff to be happy and especially to change bad habits. And she, I, um, I just wanted to take a moment to encourage people to, if there are questions um, for Father Shanley, either about this podcast or, uh, or anything um, about my and the things that we're talking about here in the science of, of happiness, please um, please go ahead and put those in the chat now. We'll come back to those in, in just a minute. Um, I, I, she comes back to this idea of, um, of figuring out happiness or, or addressing your own happiness 
and thinking about it in context. Um, so the idea that uh, people who are going through a, a bad time, if you share that with some, somebody, it actually makes the, it worse for you. If you're going enjoying something and somebody else, you're, you're having an ice cream cone and, and somebody sits down next to you and is enjoying their ice cream cone, that ice cream tastes better. There are, there are uh, things that are happening in the brain that they can measure to show that you are, that when you are experiencing pleasure, a shared pleasure with somebody that you, your brain is reacting to that. Same thing on the negative side. And I, I thought about when I, when I was listening to that during this period, it made me think back to the screen time, but also just we're all going through this time of uncertainty and the, this idea of um, we're all feeling really, it, we're all feeling very challenged during this time. So I wonder, are we feeling it all together in a, 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 a negative way that's making it even more challenging for us? So do we, how do we reframe? Right. I think that's the that's the key. And I think that's what you were getting at, too, is just reframing that and something like some good news or, or other programs like that help us to do that. Yeah. You know, it's funny. One of the things that Aristotle questioned that he poses about friendship is he asks, are friendships uh, more important in bad times or in good times? Mm -hmm. And he says you could argue that they're more important in bad times because they help you get through them. Um, and that's part of what friendship is about. Um, but he also argues, on the other hand, um, friends are also valuable in good times because you can share your experience with your friends. So I think in both good times and bad times, just the simple, uh, I mean, one of the things that Laurie talks about, and I actually, it was a whole episode, and I went and bought the book of the shrink that uh, he was, she was talking to, was Compassion and how important compassion is. And uh, it's important for the people that we are compassionate with, and it's important for ourselves. And I think, you know, one of the virtues that we can practice in the middle of all this is to develop deeper capacity for compassion in our lives. And uh, I'm forgetting the name of the shrink who wrote the book, but he, there's a whole, I read a whole book about compassion. Uh, and uh, that's a, you know, as old as the hills uh, in terms of people understanding that as a virtue, it cuts across every religion. Um, and psychologists would distinguish between empathy and compassion and empathy is the capacity to feel what other people feel, whereas compassion has more of an active connotation than I feel what you feel and I wanna do something to help you because I feel what you feel. Um, and that the, our ability in this time of you know, COVID, uh, COVID uh, pandemic to be more compassionate. Uh, and, you know, and I'm finding my emotions are raw in this pandemic that like I watch John Krasinskis and I cry. I'm like, I never cry watching videos, but he makes, and he makes me laugh. And uh, I'm like, you know, you watch the news and you see all these heroic people and uh, it's sort of, you start to think, again, I always come back when they're interviewing these nurses and doctors, they're going, what amazing people they are. And, um, and yet, I watched a little bit of the news last night, their mental health is really damaged in all this because they don't feel like heroes. They feel, often they feel what they focus on is their failures. Like I didn't save this patient or I, this person died. And it's like, everybody's going through different emotions in this time. Um, tied together a lot by anxiety, uh, but maybe it's compassion and the, the practice of that that can really help us get through this. I, I want to bring up another um, attribute, uh, and that's resilience. Um, there is a question um, from Ellen um, Chiampi, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, about when students come back to PC in the fall. Um, and, and come back to, to campus um, and, and will they arrive, do, her, her question is, will they arrive on campus differently with regard to attributes of happiness and being resilient? Um, how, do you, how do you see this changing the, the students uh, related to happiness and resilience? Yeah, I mean, I've talked a lot, um, I preached on Easter on this topic of grief. Uh, and I just finished reading a book on grief. 
um, that's really, really good by David um, Stillman, I think is his name. Uh, no, Kesselman, David Kesselman. And I, I think we have to all acknowledge that our students are going through a grieving process. You know, and you think like, like Krasinska's thing about graduation, like you're missing one of the, uh, the pivotal moments of your life where you mark with this formality that you move from one stage to another. And we're gonna have uh, students, first year students coming in, you know, they had all expectations of their spring of senior year like our kids have. Um, they've lost relationships. So I think, you know, we all, we have to acknowledge um, that we're all living with some kind of loss. And how you get through loss in life. Um, and, you know, this is where religious traditions can come in. This is where psychologists can help people get through loss in their lives. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that I forget whether it was Lori or somebody else said this is that uh, young people aren't able to contextualize things in the way that older people are because they just don't have the life experience. And part of what parents need to do in this time of pandemic with their children is say it's okay to be afraid or it's okay to be a little bit upset about things that you're losing. But when kids say things like, you know, I'm never gonna see my friends again. No, you're gonna see your friends again. This is gonna be over. But the younger you are, the more a catastrophe feels like a catastrophe because you don't have the experience to get through it. And I think this is what uh, we of our generation, old people like me, um, can hopefully impart to young people is, there will be life on the other side of this. And there will be losses in every person's life. Uh, and for me, you know, this is where religion is so helpful because I, I know God's going to bring good things out of it. And frankly, I've seen so much good. I didn't need Krasinskis, but he sure helps that there's a lot of good. And being able to acknowledge the loss, um, being able to maybe reframe uh, which, which experience can help you do the situation that you're in, and developing your own inner capacities for resourcefulness and resilience, it's gonna be, um, you know, <laughs> this is a whole nother podcast I started to listen to recently um, by this woman, Brene Brown. And um, hers are a little too long for me. I don't think I'm gonna get hooked on her. And she doesn't reassure me like Lori, but she's kind of fun to listen to. And, and the first uh, podcast, uh, it, the title of it was arresting and, and is not revealed until about 10 minutes in. So here comes a reveal. FFT is the title of it and it's first effing time. And the anxiety that we go through when we have to do something for the first time. We, we're, it's stressful, we're confused, we're easily frustrated. Um, and, I'm, and she gets to the pandemic in the end. It's like, this is the first pandemic I've lived through. I mean, we've had others, but not that threaten the entire population like this one does. And we're all learning how to get through it. And that's part of what we need to talk some of our younger people through who've never been through anything like this. Like, we can get through this. It's the first time that you're going through this. And it seems scary and you don't know what to do. But we're all in this together. It's the FFT for all of us. Mm -hmm. Uh, a little trick there. I, I listened to uh, that podcast on one and a half speed. <laughs> I get through it a little quicker. Um, sometimes uh, they're in some of these podcasts with slow talkers. Brene Brown is one of them. I, I get through it quicker on one and a half speed. So there's that. But yes. Well, that's uh, helpful because that's why I like Lori so much. She's an academic. She cuts to the point. Brene yeah. wants to chit chat. I feel like I'm watching <laughs> Oprah and I'm like, come on, let's just get to the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple of other questions have come in. Um, Sadia Aman is on the call. Um, and Sadia asks, uh, what would you suggest to stay connected to our faith and communities? Um, aside from the online services, online discussions, you know, how do, how do, we, how do we stay that connected with our faith? Yeah, I mean, this is something uh, I feel horrible about folks that can't get the comfort that comes from gathering as a community to worship, uh, because that's so much a part of our faiths. 
um, is to come in, together and worship and uh, to be nursed spiritually by ministers and to sing hymns and uh, for Catholics, the sacraments and, and all that. And, you know, there's a sense in which, again, um, I think sometimes the things that we've lost in this, um, we can appreciate maybe in a different way um, because of not having them. And there's a sense of, uh, I'll be interested to see uh, on the other side of this, where more are more people going to church or will people have gotten used to not going to church? And I think every minister of every denomination I know is worried about that. It's like, okay, people haven't gone to church for a while. Are they going to flock back in droves or are they just going to say, you know what, I, I don't need this? Um, but the other thing is it, that it forces, I think, all of us who don't have the comforts of communal worship to develop our one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. It's like, you know, I sit there and go, okay, God, it's you and me. Uh, we're in a pandemic. And I find myself having more time to pray in a pandemic. Um, and I, I'm kind of liking that. I'm like, I, I got to figure out how to translate um, being more God-centered uh, when I get this job back, if I ever do. Well, I, I don't think I will. Not the job as I knew it. Um, and I'm going out anyway. But sort of trying to figure out how do I take the time that I have now to deepen my own relationship with God. Um, I think people may, as I am, may be finding um, that this actually is a spiritually fruitful time. That's very helpful, thank you. I, uh, I, I think some of what you were just mentioning there too is that when you talk about loss, it's going back to grief again, right? Is it? Um, and I wonder if when uh, there's another another question question here from um, Francesca Bishop, who I, I work very closely with, that's acknowledging kind of that loss and that that grief um, associated with not being able to to go to your parish or something something that could be much much worse. But um, you had said you just read a great book on on grief. I wonder if there's uh, any lessons learned there for no matter what type of loss you're experiencing working through that versus around it or i'm not sure uh if there are any um tactics we can kind of employ right now yeah um I i'm reading a book right now called spiritual excuse me emotional agility by susan david who's a harvard psychologist and um i'm going to back into the grief story this way she talks about um the book is about dealing with difficult emotions. And one of the things she said is that, uh, you know, there is no such thing as a negative emotion, that all of our emotions are meant to teach us something about ourselves. And that the challenge that we have in our lives is to figure out what the meaning of uh, this emotion is. And grief is one of those. And so um, the book that I, I was talking about um, is about finding meaning in grief. It's the, you know, there's famously six stages in, of dying and six stages of grieving. And um, what he comes up with, he says, well, I think there's a seventh. And the seventh is the finding of meaning. Um, and the meaning is not like, you know, why God did you allow this bad thing to happen to me so that I lost something that I cared about? The meaning is, how do I take um, the pain of my grief over whatever it is that I've lost? And what do I learn about myself because of my grief? What resolutions might I make going forward? Um, how can I, you know, a lot of folks that lose a loved one um, find meaning in, for example, if you lost your loved one to cancer like I did, it's like donating money to cancer research or getting involved, maybe even doing a hospice ministry or something like that. It's like, how do I take this emotion that's negative and find out how to look at myself and my life differently out of the other side of it? Um, because as she says in her book, um, with negative emotions, you can do two things. On the one hand, you can bottle them up on the side and say, I don't wanna feel those. Uh, and they're not gonna go away and they're gonna bite you if you do that. The other is to be overwhelmed uh, by it and, and, in a sense, uh, frozen by it. Instead, um, she says, you've got to face them and deal with them and try to find out what they mean for you. 
So there's stuff, uh, even the bad stuff that happens to us, we can learn something about ourselves from it. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering what that seventh um, phase of loss will be with losing Tom Brady, right? We don't know. What, how do we find meaning in that? I'm not sure. Well, I, I maybe I haven't gotten there yet, but um, we do have uh, just the course, and uh, then I think that we, um, we're we closing in on one o'clock. Um, but uh, so uh, Teddy Christie says um, that, asked the question, how do you relate happiness to optimism? Um, or, or, and, I, and I don't recall Lori getting into this, but I might have missed it at some point. Um, but would you say they're directly related or, or how, how, do we, how can we promote optimism through happiness? Or vice versa, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think there's a kind, you know, optimism is a, like a positive posture that you have about thinking things are going to get better. Um, but sometimes optimism, like anything, can be an extreme where you're, you know, even you're in the midst of a really bad situation and, and you can't even recognize it because you, you have to be optimistic about things. So I think being happy um, involves the ability to, to in, a, in a sense, and she talks about this in the, in the beginning of the podcast, and it actually is correlated to a lot of um, even philosophical research that I've done, at one level, happiness is an inner state. Um, it's, it's something that lies in, in largely in our emotional lives, but also in, in the life of our mind in general. Um, but, and I actually taught a book about meaning and happiness uh, this semester, and I think one of the examples that um, she uses or, in the book, Susan Wolf is the philosopher. Um, it's like collecting baseball cards. She doesn't use that example. I'm making this one up. Like, if I find my, uh, or I'll give you an example. Um, I was watching an interview with an athlete last week, and this guy can do Rubik's cubes in less than a minute, mm. even while having a conversation with somebody. And I'm like, wow, uh, I don't know how this guy did it. Uh, but if you spent your life um, just working on Rubik's Cube, and that made you subjectively feel really good because it's a, it's a little, uh, your brain gets a little adrenaline rush or whatever the dopamine that makes you feel good when you solve a puzzle. Mm -hmm. If you did that all day long, you're like, well, I'm happy. Um, and, but most philosophers say, well, no, because there's also an objective component about happiness. It, it, you have to be doing something truly meaningful in your life to be happy. So that ability to find inner satisfaction with objectively good kinds of activities is basically what happiness is. Um, and I don't think happiness is necessarily the same as optimism, but I do think um, that they kind of go together if you, if you start to believe um, that, and Aristotle talks about this in the, uh, the beginning of the Nicomachean Ethics, he, t uh, he says, you know, for really good people, bad stuff can happen in your life. And he uses Priam, uh, the king of Troy, who undergoes horrible uh, loss with the death of Hector and the, and the besiegement of his city. And Aristotle says it would be strange to call Priam happy. And yet at one level, nothing that happened to him can take away his virtue uh, because there is something interior to it. But Aristotle says, well, maybe we call him happy, but we wouldn't call him blessed um, because how our lives turn out is not necessarily in our control. And so in a time of pandemic, um, you know, we, there, we're experiencing the loss of control and maybe the inability to do a lot of things that we find meaningful activities in our lives. And yet we're still the people that we are. And there are still ways in which we can interiorly uh, become better people, even in the midst of circumstances that we can't control. And that's, I think, some of the things that Laurie is talking about in the podcast. There are, even in the midst of a pandemic, there's a lot you can do uh, to continue to grow in your own character.
Well, I think that's a great place to end and very comforting to, to think about that we are, we are who, who we are and that doesn't change. That's not uncertain. That's, that's us. And, and um, so I thank you for that. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time. I definitely, the, a lot of, you've made a lot of references today to books and podcasts that you are reading. We um, would love to uh, follow up with you, Father Shanley, and, and maybe put together that list and share it with those who are on the podcast, to, I mean, on the um, Zoom session today, uh, because I think we'd all like to dig into some of those as, uh, as you say, as we have a little bit of extra free time right now. Um, so... Thank you so much, Father Shanley, and thank, thank you, you to everybody. It yeah, it was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed it, and I'm um, looking forward to listening to today's episode, which I haven't gotten to listen to either, um, but thank you so much, and thank you to everybody who's joined today. Really, really appreciate uh, you being part of the Friar Ties program and, um, and trying to be uh, together alone, as it were, so thank you so much. <laughs>